Hello, good, good afternoon to everybody. This is Miguel Oliveira. I'm the president of the Brazilian Linguistics Association, and it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, Sinfre Maconi. Uh, Maconi was born in Zimbabwe and did his primary and secondary education in Zimbabwe. He started his first degree in, in Liberia at uh, Katigon University before moving to Ghana, where he completed his first degree. He then returned to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and taught briefly at the University of Zimbabwe before moving to Edinburgh, Scotland for his PhD. Upon completing his PhD, he taught in a number of universities in South Africa before moving to the United States. He currently teaches both in the United States and is an extraordinary professor at the University of the Northwest South, South Africa and is an Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Fellow at Laikipia University in Kenya. He has published ex extensively and his work appears in a number of journals, which includes Current Issues in Language Policy, Journal of Multicultural Discourses, Language in Society, Language, Culture and Society. His research is largely into colonial linguistics, language policy and planning, Southern epistemologies and philosophies of language. His most recent book are Innovations and Challenges in Applied Linguistics from the Global South with Alistair Pennicott Cook uh, by Rutledge, 2019, in Language Policy and Planning Semiotics of Space and ethnicities with Ash, Ashraf, Ashraf Bahai and uh, Christine Severo from Cambridge Schoolers to 2019. So without further ado, uh, let's hear uh, uh, Professor Sinfra Marconi's talk for today, which is titled Southern Multilingualisms toward decolonizing the social linguistics of Africa. Thank you, Professor Maconi, for, for joining Abrali El Vivo series. Now the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for extending the invitation to me in your capacity as the president of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. I would also like to thank um, Professor Sef for helping me organize this, um, this particular talk. Mm -hmm. The title of my presentation as the president of the Brazilian Association has pointed out is Southern Multilingualisms Toward Decolonizing the Sociolinguistics of Africa. In this preamble, I want to begin with a statement by Edward Said, the well-known person, Edward Said, in a powerful indictment of intellectuals, charges that we have read too much and loved too little. And in an in indictment, which may be true of scholars from both, you could say, the Global North and the Global South. I want to begin with a long quotation from uh, a colleague called David Beat, um, which appears in a book, the, in one of my most recent books, which uh, 2020. And I, I begin with the quotation, open quote, I did not become a missionary linguist as Plandy says. I fell in love with a woman who was of the wrong way. A follower of Antichrist, my parents would have said, had they ever known of her. After having abandoned my religion in favor of her, she informed me that she was not interested in me. Such is life. We have only the love in our hearts. By my love, I am born 
whithersoever I am born, wrote Augustine the African Christian. And so it is with theory. It is oriented by our loves. Unfortunately, theory is not only restricted by our loves, but also by our hatreds. Therein lies the, the crucial question directed at all theories and religions and those who profess them. Who, who do you love? So of course, the question would have, been, would have been, whom do you love? But among those influenced by Roy Harris, you can get away with either way of expressing your of expressing yourself. The important issue is the bit about love, David Bate, 2020. Now I shift on to a discussion about the ontologies of language and multilingualism. Contemporary sociolinguistic scholarship takes it as axiomatic that the world is multilingual. The conceptual shift toward multilingualism is, however, not been predicated on any prior philosophical analysis of what Heck and Hurick would call the natures of language, or on any systematic inquiry into the questions of which type of and whose multilingualism with which we are dealing. There are two emerging trends in sociolinguistics, but neither addresses the epistemologies and indigenous ontologies of language that are necessary in the analysis of multilingualism. The first trend avoids the use of the notion of a language or language through frameworks such as languaging, discourse, and community or performance. The second may seek to expand our horizons of linguistic communication through terms such as multimodality, semiotic systems, and gestures but may at the same time maintain a commitment to languages as identifiable enumerable entities as illustrated in variants of research on multimodality based on systemic functional grammar. Neither approach, unfortunately, addresses the underlying question of the epistemologies and ontologies of language. In this presentation, I therefore seek to address the underlying notion of multilingualisms by drawing on three uh, different sets of analytical um, apparatus, assemblages, indigenous ontologies, and entangled electrical wires. I illustrate how the use of the term lay person from integrational linguistics can be used to facilitate a decolonization of applied linguistics because modern linguistics and anthropology, uh, as the Brazilian Indian scholar Raja Gopulan puts it, historically viscerally tied to colonialism. By taking into account indigenous cosmovisions, for example, of language practices, and challenging the ontology of language, it is conceptually feasible to start to move away from both monolingual and multilingual approaches to language and take on board insights that are not from the mainstream of language studies and thereby generate concepts about language that are appropriate to the global south and paradoxically may be appropriate to the global north as well. But the, the key question remains, what is the global south? And I quote from um, my recent work with, uh, with Alistair Pennycook here. It is not, the ETA is referring to the global south. It, it is not, it must be said, an idea not without its own challenges and contradictions. Though it is no less important as a result, simply put, the global south refers to people, places, and ideas that have been left out of the grand narrative of modernity. It may refer quite literally to the south, to regions of South America and much of Africa, for example, that have not been part of the upward march of economic, social, and political progress in wealthier nations. More importantly, however, the global south refers to equally 
refers to broader histories of exclusion and disenfranchisement. And that might equally refer to indigenous communities in North America, New Zealand, Australia, and Latin America. The South, to quote from Santos' perspective, refers both to one condition of suffering and inequality brought about by capitalism and colonialism, and two, to resistance to such conditions. The Global North and Global South can also be uh, understood as what we can call in integrational linguistics super categories. From an integrational linguistic perspective, as Fang 2020 puts it, both the Global North and the Global South are identical conceptually. Although I would hasten to add, they carry different political significance. They are equivalent to what Roy Harris in 2003 and 2005 refers to as super categories. Both are products of a series of human communicational activities. They are both second order categories. Now, what is the nature of the relationship between the global south and universalism? But before exploring that relationship, what is universalism? For the African um, scholar, Ghanaian scholar based in South Africa, Kwesi Kwa Pra, the objective of African scholarship should be, and I quote, to achieve a universalism under restrictive Western hegemony. And to this end, he continues, the center of gravity of knowledge production about Africa and Africans must be situated in Africa. So the otherness of the subject of scholarship which Western hegemony has imposed on Africans is eliminated. And yet, while a project to include multiple voices rather than, rather than only those of the hegemonic North is welcome, this raises further questions about an attempt to seek a more inclusive universalism. And the question is, is universalism a project to which the global South should seek to aspire, or is it one which it should seek to undermine? The global South and universalism, and I continue. These are hard questions. And only the, and the only universal truth, I would argue now, is the truth of complexity. And reality is always much more complex than it appears. And as Santos reiterates on many occasions, the Western understanding of the world is as important as it is partial. Now on Western sociolinguistics and what you can call the segregational foundation of language. Western sociolinguistics is strongly committed to a linguistic ideology of the existence of separate and identifiable languages. And in particular, the Western grammatical tradition itself which is central to the whole conception of what a language is. A sociolinguistics image, it did not challenge this segregational foundation, but merely sought to find what you can call social correlates for the linguistic entities that segregational linguistics had identified. What is absent from the canon of sociolinguistics in the global north is scholarship that has emerged outside Euro-America, especially from the global south, that is, those parts of the world that have been the object of European colonialism since the 15th century, and that constitute the majority of the world, which adopts a critical segregationalist ontology of enumerable entities called language. Now I turn, on to, I turn to the issue about the types of multilingualism. The frequently studied multilingualism, at least in Africa, is one that includes a combination of a European language and an African language. That is the product of colonialism. This inadvertently fosters the impression that a type of multilingualism that includes European languages and African languages is more important than one that is comprised of only African languages. This, alas, extends the legacy of colonialism into sociolinguistics, which creates a hierarchy of different types of multilingualisms, with a multilingualism composed of European languages and African languages as more important than that made up of African languages only. Now towards decolonial sociolinguistics. The decolonial sociolinguistics that I'm proposing here is a critique of the Western language tradition and its ethnocentric and culture-centric foundations. 
believe in the existence of language is just one more diagnostic of this ethnocentric endemic in the orthodox position of the Western tradition of linguistics. Integrational linguistics resist that ethnocentricity by treating the description of languages as second order constructs. Thus, instead of rushing to add to the world's stockpile of grammars and dictionaries, as does the Summer Institute of Linguistics, the integrationist will analyze the grammar of grammarians and the lexicographer of lexicographers. In other words, considers grammars and dictionaries qua metalinguistic instruments, examine how they function, what cultural purposes they serve, what metalinguistic concepts they employ and promote. But what is decolonization? A possible working definition. Although the concept of decolonization is controversial, in this presentation, I, I, I construe it to be a polit to quote Garcia and Baja, a political, epistemic, and ethical project that surfaces from local histories elsewhere and otherwise, and speaks back to the world system that affects all aspects of society. Most multilingual research has tended to be written and produced in a European language, predominantly English. Such research is also conducted in an epistemology associated with a European worldview, such that the studies may be multilingual, but the medium of reporting and analysis has been largely monolingual. This has fostered and reinforced an illusion that the multilingualism that is reported in English studies is universally applicable to all other contexts even if it is applicable to a limited range of contexts in which English or a, a, and a European language play a significant role. Now, what about language descriptions and African sociolinguistic experiences? It is the aim of this presentation to explore multilingualism from a Southern and a decolonial perspective, consistent with the work by, um, by Cornell, Mignolo, and Walsh, and Santos, et cetera. That the global South seizes is not simply a site of data collection, but a space where existing theories are formulated, as the African philosopher Hontoji puts it, using Southern, Southern multilingualisms as illustrations. But anyone who studies the history of modern general linguistics cannot fail to be struck by the extent to which the underlying assumptions about language in African sociolinguistics are out of step with the experiences of language as lived by most Africans in post-colonial societies. Now, if that is the case, what are the problems that are being raised here? The two problems that are being raised here, this is the issue about sociolinguistic experiences and theoretical framework. And let me try and, uh, let me try and uh, identify those problems. What do you do if my theoretical perspective cannot describe my languages, what do I do? This is an important question, which is particularly relevant to uh, integrational linguistics and to decolonial sociolinguistics. Socio because do I then abandon my, uh, my experience or do I abandon my analytical, my, my analytical framework? And I want to find a way of, get, of addressing this thing, that particular uh, dilemma, through uh, by citing again the work by David Bead using what I call here the peacock anecdote. And let me quote David Bead here. Not long ago, he says, he writes in, um, in, the, in, the, in, his, in the recent book uh, which I've edited. Not long ago, I, I refer here to David. David Bead, I hired a chimney sweep to check my fireplace. And upon his arrival, he noticed my peacocks in the driveway. And the person asked, where do you keep your peacocks, he asked. And I replied, they like to roost atop the chimney. He shook his head, his head and said, peacocks are flightless birds. They cannot fly, close quote. And as he said this, one peacock flew straight up over his head and alighted about 35 feet up on the roof near the chimney. He stood there staring at the peacock on the roof and repeated, peacocks are flightless birds, they cannot fly. And as if to drive his point home to that insolent peacock, or perhaps merely to reassure himself about the accuracy of his knowledge. 
multilingualism from the perspective of um, everyday language user. Integrationism, I would like to argue, is relevant to decolonial uh, social linguistics because uh, integrationism is based on a critical inquiry into the concepts needed to understand our lay experiences of everyday communication. We deploy these concepts consciously or unconsciously wherever we speak or write. They provide a framework for making sense of the communication in which we find ourselves in our own activity. Now, what are the approaches that one may use to frame Southern multilingualism? One, one may use um, notions of metrolingualism as initially articulated by Penny Cook and, uh, and Uchi, and then assemblages, indigenous co uh, cosmovisions, or one may uh, um, draw upon uh, epistemologies and on and ontologies for them we call terra-centric uh, based ontologies, or one may use ocean based uh, ontologies or sea, sea, seascape ontologies, or one may use a combination of both land and sea um, ontologies as uh, Christine Severo and myself do. And let me uh, continue. M markets, migration, and multilingualism. If all the images spontaneously rather than by design, Multilingualism, therefore, is a form of spontaneous order. Spontaneous order of organizations, they are scale-free, meaning that their size is not predictable. Spontaneous no orders are not knowable in their totality because of the limits of individual knowledge. Organizations can be part of spontaneous orders but spontaneous part of organizations. Spontaneous orders are neither created nor controllable by anyone. In economic terms, multilingualisms are a, co are a consequence of human actions rather than predetermining them. Then another concept that is useful in a discussion of a decolonial social linguistics is the notion of system D. System D is relevant to an analysis of Southern multilingualism. System D is a slang phrase with roots in Francophone Africa and the Caribbean. It is a word which is used to describe effective and self-motivated, resourceful, ingenious, and creative people. System D takes a, as its basic premise that, uh, that, that all human beings are extremely uh, expert in their own existence. So the concept is compatible and uh, extends the notion of um, integrational uh, creativity. Informal economies interact with and affect formal economies at a dispersed micro level with an aggregate effect that might be easily underestimated. Similarly, in a linguistic context, most people function and move relatively easily across different social organizations, taking their language and language usage with them. Even when individuals temper their speaking behavior to fit the context of the moment, overlap is inevitable. The sociolinguistic imprint of such migration is evident in the nature of language practices, which include bits and pieces of language and discourses from many domains, rural and urban, local, regional, and more recently, computer-mediated and cell phone-mediated discourses. To move across and within multiple contexts, meeting others from different countries and from diverse socioeconomic language backgrounds requires an astute ability to use and create necessary resources. Further, if we accept the premise that uh, to fend for yourself in predatory context, you need to be creative, we need a framework of language that captures the notion of creativity to the imagined language. And I want to push on, move on, and talk about how, in a discussion of uh, decolonial social linguistics, we can move from semiotic assemblages to what you can call polyphonic music, and then people, places, and objects in, in transition. A series of studies of markets and corner shops has led social linguistics to the direction of um, what uh, Alistair Penico calls assemblages, drawing on research from a post-humanistic perspective. A focus on semiotic assemblages is part of a critical sociolinguistics of diversity that studies unregimented transversal interactions which are appropriate to research into Southern multilingualism. Assemblages, and uh, if I may quote uh, my work with Christine Severo, are a temporary arrangement of 
different things in a non-hierarchical array of shifting associations of, of varying degrees of durability. Now, what is the status of semiotic assemblages within African context? It is conceivable, however, that semiotic assemblages, although an extremely robust framework in Africa, has to be expanded so that it can adequately describe and answer the question of how the entities which make up these as semiotic assemblages actually fasten to each other. It is possible that we should complement metaphors of semiotic assemblages with those that come from the from polyphonic music. Now, let's sit back and reflect a bit on semiotic assemblages and link that with, uh, with Southern multilingualism. To decenter communicational episodes, we may end up with another dehumanized third person analytic construct superimposed on the linguistic experiences of individuals. Any claim, however, to any third person perspective on sign making is understood as reductionist, in the sense that there is no methodology available currently to assign definitively and objectively available meanings to utterances, text, or human behavior in general, as Chris Hutton puts it in, in 2020. The fundamental issue, therefore, is what is the source of the semiotic linguistic value in Africa? It is not the material itself that is communicational value. The analytical apparatus I'm proposing here situates communication within the dynamic integration of activities in a specific setting. This is important because communication is, is, is kept, captured in any system's best model, if I may quote uh, Chris Hutton again. A decolonial social linguistics being proposed here does not require the assumption of language. Communication, however, may however still face the challenge of stating in general terms the conditions for communication for both self and interpersonal communication without providing a culturally biased definition of what communication means. The notion of communication is clearly not an unproblematic concept. In Anglophone scholarship, for example, as num numerous Global South scholars have argued, the notion of communication is problematic. Southern multilingualism and adulto-centric perspective. Now, the question one may ask, is it feasible that Southern multilingualisms are adulto-centric? Southern multilingualisms are likely to be adulto-centric since they may take the human adult as the starting point for their theorization, thereby distorting issues about human ontology and failing to capture a time when we are, and I quote, uh, Adrian Pablo here, uh, one at one with the world, a holistic phase characterized by the absence of distinctions between language and non-language, the self and other, subject and object, something and nothing, personal and external, uh, present and future. Now, how do we rethink language uh, diversity in the global south? The move to rethink language in terms of social practices involves both a reversal of the relationship between language and language use named languages, uh, understood as second order phenomenon that emerged from first order level interaction. And an understanding of language in terms of resources used in conjunction with other semiotic resources. Another element in this rethink of language involves a serious engagement with ways in which languages have to be understood from a non-Western perspective. This leads us to the politics of reification and Southern multilingualism. The politics of reification is highly complex. This can be seen in contemporary social and politically inflected social, social linguistics. But as Chris Hutton argues, there is no direct relationship at abstract level between anti-essentialism anti in language theory and progressive politics. For integrationists, for example, languages are second order constructs which are reified in contingent ways, but which do not exist as autonomous entities outside the, the flow of first order instantiations. But this does not tell us how to understand the politics of nation state, institutions, or families. The Western concept of a language is a reification which has colonized and continues to colonize the life worlds of language. When we follow this path, a set of very difficult theoretical and methodological challenges emerge, which have recently come under the broad umbrella of Southern theories. 
What about uh, indigenous cosmovisions? In applied linguistics, underwritten by epistemologies of the South, must be grounded in concepts that seek to expand the repertoires of social emancipation that can constitute alternatives to neoliberalism through indigenous cosmovisions or emancipatory scripts, as I've written um, extensively recently. <coughs> Excuse me. Examples of emancipatory scripts are, for example, Ubuntu, Nepantla, I am what I am because of who we all are. By combining the mutual interdependence implied by the idea of Ubuntu, languages only exist because, as, because others do, and the pre precarious borderlands thinking that Nepantla languages are unstable intermediate entities rather than being firmly bounded, I envisage a multilingualism which goes beyond plural and parallel monolingualism. Now, what is the difference between and in between? Although the differences between and in between may seem slight, almost imperceptible in verbal expression, it is of enormous ontological consequences. Between articulates a divided world that is already carved at the joints. It is a bridge, a hinge, a connection, an attraction of opposites, a link in a chain, a double-headed arrow that points at once to this and to that. In between, by contrast, is a movement of generation and dissolution in a world of becoming, where things are not yet given, said that they might then be joined up, but on the way to being given, it is intercial differentiation, efficient fusion reaction, a winding, unwinding, inhalation, exhalation, flowing one way in one direction and uh, flowing in, in another direction, but with no final direction. Now, what about mango beat and southern multilingualism? The hybrid word mango beat, the symbol for which uh, is a crab, mixes the ideas of the mangrove and technology. The word mango, M-A-N-G-U-E, also carries connotations of the social experiences of marginalized peoples. It is an in-between metaphor, but unlike the other in-between metaphor, it is a combination of land and sea. It has the additional advantage of referring to a type of artistic thinking inspired by Deleuze and Guattari, and Jumadi proposes a rhizomatic interpretation of the mango. Now, let me push the argument further. Language is mass and language account. Famous sociolinguistics of multilingualism has been a pluralization of the countable aspects of language. It's feasible we've been pluralizing the wrong thing, I want to argue. Language as mass is also pluralizable. Language as mass may also have multiple nat natures. Multilingualism, whether of a single or of many languages, is important because of the relationship between language and worldviews. I take the view of the relationship between language and worldviews, which may be construed as anti warfare because it is not a question of world based languages, but it is a question of the views of language which are based on social views. Now, let me get back and try and conclude and reflect on this. What I've been trying to say here is that the notion of Southern multilingualism recognizes that there are not only different kind, kinds of multilingualisms, but different ways in which language resources may be interwoven. And that it is thus important to recognize that there might be multiple ontologies. Decolonial sociolinguistics seeks to overcome the division so deeply entrenched in the Western thought and science between the world of nature and the world of human society. The quest for a theory always arises, however you could say, from an a theoretical impulse. Impulse arises from in which the theory builds their lives. Southern theory arises from the experience of colonization and is both empowered and you could argue limited by its moral uh, argument. Southern theory will not lead us, I want to conclude, to know the mind of God, but hopefully it might lead us to a better understanding of the mind of Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sinfred Marconi. We have a couple of questions here in the chat. So the first one is uh, by Daniel Silva, and he asks the following. Brazilian anthropology is famous for its serious engagement with indigenous knowledges. Viveiros de Castro, for instance, bans Western science by showing that Amerindians think not of a single nature 
and many cultures, multiculturalism, but of a single culture and in men and many natures. Trees, for instance, have our same culture, but live in a different nature. They think like we do. What I would like to ask is how to promote the same sort of engagement with indigenous uh, local knowledges in Southern linguistics. Maybe you could comment on your work with Severo on Ubuntu. Yes, yes, yes. The, my feeling is that um, it's important to move beyond an idea of uh, social linguistics which revolves around human beings only. I'm more inclined to think of a universe in which human beings are interacting with other non-human being species in spe using specific and special types of um, types of uh, communicational registers. In other words, what me and Christine try and do is to avoid a type of social linguistics that centers around the human being. And then the second thing which is there is that what the notion of Ubuntu provides you is the idea of interconnectedness. We all are human because I'm human because you are human. And one can extend that even to other species. Um, I'm this type of species because you also are a different type of species. We all are mutually interdependent. So we see with Christine Severo the potential of uh, using Ubuntu to capture a more, you could add, a very friendly and uh, grounded social linguistics. Okay, thank you. And there's another question here, and it is related to your work on security policy. Oh, yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a, a work related to your work on security okay, police okay. in South mm -hmm. Africa. Okay. How can we, as a Global South schoolers, avoid presenting local communities as only characterized by violence? Ah, good, good, good. Well, yeah, what is important there is um, to be able to realize the complexity of uh, what it means to live and to use the language within um, Southern context. So for example, when you read my scholarship on security in South Africa, um, particularly the narratives where the students and the police are interacting. I point out, for example, that one of the challenges that the police are faced with when they are interacting with, when they are trying to uh, attack students, is that they find themselves moving in and out of a number of different identities, right? On the one hand, they are institutionally regarded as the police, but they are also related to these particular students who are fighting a particular cause which is within their own interest. And then secondly, the students also don't only see the police as, um, as police, they also see them as individuals who are related to, to them. So there's this multiplicity of identities which complicates the nature of the relationship between the police and the students. And then what you also find out, which is very interesting, which is important there, is that um, the issues about security are important in terms of curriculum design. To what extent, for example, when you militarize an institution, what is the impact of a militarization of an institution on the nature and type of scholarship which is produced within that particular community, within the university? Right. What type of sociolinguistics do you, what are the implications on, on sociolinguistics which take place if you are in a university that has become militarized? That I think is an important point to add for us to be able to consider. 
Okay, thank you. There is another question here by Alexander Kovina. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Would you elaborate a bit on your relationship with the Worf Worfian hypothesis? Ah, uh, yes. Thank uh, you. Okay. And the relationship between language, culture, and worldview. Okay, that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah, generally, um, this is my, my, my thinking. Um, typically, in a Wolfian view, it's your view of the world is to some extent influenced largely by the nature and type of language that you are using. But what I'm, what I'm, where I am at the moment uh, in my, my thinking is the exact opposite. Is that my view of, uh, of language is influenced uh, by and large by the society that I am in. In other words, what I'm interested in at the moment, which is very interesting, is that I'm interested in an analysis of what are the different types of folk linguistic categories or what are the different types of cultural um, con concepts about language which exist within those particular societies. In other words, what I'm arguing here basically is this, is that linguistics and the meta discourses that it produces constitute only one type of what of, um, of, um, of meta discourses about language. There are other folk linguistic categories about language which we could be able to, watch, to try and tap, to try and take advantage of. And that is where I'm interested in lay, lay person's interpretation of language. What do they understand by language? What is the impact for them of, uh, of the relationship between language and culture? Yes. Okay, Professor Sintre Maikoni, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, uh, we invite people to continuing uh, making questions after this uh, transmission. And uh, Professor Maikoni, you are very welcome to go back to the chat and answer the questions there. The questions will be posted there as well, okay? okay. I'd like to thank you once again for your brilliant talk, and uh, I'd like you to, to, to say some final words, please. Okay. Oh, do you want me to say some final words? Oh, if you okay. want. Yes, yes, okay. This, okay, this is where we are. Um, I'm currently uh, organizing a series of... Um, what you can call, uh, what we call African Studies Global Forum, in which we invite individuals to talk about their particular books. So for example, in July, um, we'll have uh, Chris Hatton, he'll be talking about his book on language and race. And at the end of July, we have um, uh, somebody called Robbie Shilliam will be talking about black bodies in white in white academy. If you are interested in joining, feel free to send me an email. The the forums are interesting in the sense that there's always a specific book, and the author comes and talks about their work, and then there are questions that are posed to the author, and then we open up the discussion like you have done here, and people comment, and we have heard so far where people from a different parts of the globe, ranging from Australia to Brazil, Oslo, etc. And what is interesting also is that the group is very diverse. Some are graduate students, others are retired professors and all that. So I would um, urge you, if you have got time to spare, we meet about once or twice a month for about an hour and an hour and a half. And the conversations are are very interesting because the authors are talking about their work and people are commenting on their work. Right. I, do you have time for one final question? I do, I do. I have, I have lots of time, yes. Okay, thank you. So the question is, uh, do you see potential for change in the protests promoted by Black Lives Movement? Oh, oh. How do you see alliances between white people and black people in it? 
Aha. Okay. 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 I think um, the issue about the Black Lives Matter, um, to some extent, have had a major impact on, at least in the US, on race relations, and I think even outside the US. Because for once, um, the issue about race is not only being raised by uh, Africans or African Americans or, or people of, uh, uh, of an African heritage, but it has also now begun, it has dawned on the white colleagues that issues about race are issues that they themselves also have to address. So from that perspective, the realization by the white communities that race is indeed their problem as well, I think is the major conceptual shift which has taken place. Right. In the, in the past, it was simply a question of all oh, the blacks fighting to try and be treated fairly. But now the whites have begun to realize, like what the whites did in South Africa, they began to realize that they can't be free. What the um, American whites are realizing is that they can't be free if the blacks feel uh, threatened. Right. That the, the only way the, the, the American whites can feel free is if the blacks don't feel threatened by the institutions that they find themselves in. Yeah, I'm much more optimistic now than I, I was in the past. It leads me to a discussion which I think, um, because um, you know, the notion of hope, radical hope, that um, we need to have a sense of, um, radical hope. You need to have a view that an alternative future is possible. So if there's anything, for example, um, the issue about Southern theories, what Southern theories do is that they provide you with an opportunity to imagine another universe, another future is possible, right? that another future is possible. So the scholarship that I'm interested in is not only one that describes what the current circumstances are, but one that says it is indeed possible to come up with an alternative arrangement about the future. All right. Okay, thank you very much, Professor uh, McConey, once again. And we don't have any more questions right now, but people... Okay. Um, Okay, there is there is actually one question by by Bert von Pixter, Pixteren. Okay. There is uh, more to language than the spoken word. Yes, languages yes. are also codif codified and institutionalized. Can we afford to leave out issues such as language planning policy? and harmonization? Yes, yes. I, I take what I would call a, an expansive view of language. In this expansive view of language, I say that um, language, yes, is more than speech. Language is much more than writing. And I would argue language is much more than what? Um, than speech harmonization than writing, for example. Language is life, and life is language, right? I take a much more expansive view of language. I don't uh, reduce it to the idea of, um, of to, to the linguistic aspect of language. My view of language is much more view. I argue that um, what is required is, a, is an expansive view of language, which incorporates within it, even within some cases, aspects about human spirituality, non-spirituality, etc. All that, that is the view that I take. It's a much more expansive view. I argue that the view of language from linguistics is reductionist. It, 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 it limits and excludes other more interesting aspects of language, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... There are some lots of uh, praises here in the chat. Someone saying great, expressive, uh, expansive view of language. Mm. And mm. so uh, 
Yeah, you can read the chat before that. Okay. Once okay. again, Professor Maconi, thank you very much for your collaboration with Abralinha okay. this, this time. Yes. And uh, I ask people to uh, uh, continue following the series Abralinha ao Vivo mm -hmm. and support and to support Abralinha at this very difficult moment yes, that yes, we are living yes. in. Yes, and, and if, for example, there's somebody who wants to continue this conversation, they should feel free to email me or to, I, I will respond. Yeah. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Someone actually asked by, uh, for your email in the chat, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah just... just, sure just you're, you're going to get emails. lots of emails. Yeah, yeah, I will answer that, yeah, right. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much for the thank invitation. You.